And with us now in the Hyundai Texans radio studio is Executive Vice President and General Manager Nick Casario. Nick, great to have you with us. Fellas, good to be here. Congratulations on the week one win. We'll get to week two, but let's put week one to bed first. That was a great victory on the road against a divisional opponent. Yeah, anytime you go on the road and can win in a division certainly has positive implications. So um, ultimately, we were able to make a few more plays than the Colts did. The Colts are a good football team. We talked about that going into the game. And I think the game kind of played out the way we thought. The explosives were a part of the game. Tackling was a part of the game. Did some things well in some areas. Some other areas we need to clean up. But overall, it's good to get started with a win and get off on the right foot. Nick, I don't know if we've talked about this in the offseason, but acquiring Joe Mixon and how that kind of came to be because – of course, when you live on Twitter, you're like, oh, the Bengals are going to release Joe Mixon. And then all of a sudden you look up and you're like, no, the Texans have traded a seventh-round pick to go get Joe Mixon. How did that all come to be? And why was Joe kind of in your crosshairs as the guy you wanted to bring here? Yeah, I would say that particular situation was probably unique. Um, I'd say that time of year is very fluid. There's a lot of transactions that take place. There's a lot of movement that's starting. Players are leaving teams. Free agents are going with other teams. Players are – or teams are releasing players. So – Keep the exact timing of it was it was overnight. They were announced that they were moving on from Joe or they're going to release Joe. So any time that something is done after the 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock central time period, it's not going to go on the wire and it's not going to be official until the following day at the 3 o'clock. So you have about 24 hours. So we were kind of working through that whole process. Um, we were involved, um, you know, made an attempt to resign Motor. Uh, you know, we were involved in some of the Barkley mm -hmm. stuff as well. Um, that was a position that we we knew we were going to add a player at some point in some capacity. So when the opportunity presented itself um, with Mixon, it was something that we discussed internally. We had the discussion actually that morning. Coaching staff kind of went through it on their end. D'Amico and I had a conversation about it and then kind of made a decision. Well, look, if this is what the cost is, um, then it might be yep. worth doing because we thought we had the ability to acquire a player that everybody liked that we thought could help our football team. So it took a little bit of work, so there's some moving parts on that. So we were able to, you know, we gave up the compensation. Um, and a part of that, too, was the contract as well. I mean, Joe's been a good football player for a number of years, been very consistent. Knock on wood, he's been a pretty durable guy. Um, I've talked about this at different points, not too dissimilar. We went through this with Jason McCourty um, when we acquired him in New England. He was released, but it was kind of in that window. So instead of – Essentially, when a player gets released, they become a free agent. So you're either going to have to comp compete for that player on the open market, or if you want to obtain his services, you know maybe you reach an agreement or give up some kind of draft compensation. So um, in the end, it, it worked out um, the way that you know we had hoped relative to Joe and, and Cincinnati was able to attain a, a seventh round pick at draft compensation. We were able to get the services of the player that we liked, and you know we're glad that Joe's here in the building. Can you discuss how you got the yards on the ground? Because it's everybody working together. Coach was very clear. Hey, tight ends, receivers. Talked about Robert Woods. Not a lot of snaps, but he was blocking. And Joe's running style as well. The ability to cut yet so physical on the front side at the same time. Yeah, the run game, essentially everybody is involved. And the, the blocking on the perimeter is a big part of it. So who handles the blocking on the perimeter? Typically it's going to be the receivers or the tight ends. So when you're on the line of scrimmage, you know, typically the tight end, if he's attached, like those six players, the offensive line plus the tight end. And if you have a fullback, there's going to be a seventh player, whether he's in the backfield or whether he's on the line of scrimmage on the other side. Those people are essentially are going to handle the bulk of the running game. And D'Amico's talked about this. We've talked about this. Big emphasis point. You're just trying to get a body on a body and account for the defense where they're aligned. So you want to make sure that, sure that you get the blockers distributed appropriately. Sometimes there's an identification. Sometimes the defense moves. You might have to adjust it on the fly. So I think if everybody understands what you're trying to accomplish on the play, Bobby's talked about this a lot, the intent of the play, what we're trying to get to. And when you go back and look at our practice going in the game, it was either Wednesday or Thursday. It was one of the better practices we had in a run game. You know, we had clean looks. We were able to get a hat on a hat. And typically, if you practice something and see it carry over in the game, there's going to be some kind of correlation. So I would say it's a collective effort. There's a lot of people that are involved, players, coaches, the scheme, and then everybody understanding what we're trying to get done on each play. And you're, you're blocking a good front. Um, we talked about, you know, we were able to get the linebackers blocked, mm -hmm. but those guys were a big part of, of the Colts' defense. So anytime you can get through the initial part of the line of scrimmage, I mean, I think their safeties ended up accumulating a number of attacks. We were able to get kind of to the second level of the defense. Once you get to the second level, then it's ultimately up to the runner. But, I mean, it's the it's the blocking. It's the runner understanding the play, making a good decision, stick his, getting his foot in the ground, having – 
exactly looked at it, but just going back, it didn't seem like we had a lot of negative runs, right? So mm. if you're at least able to get the run started and you get it moving in the right direction, then it gives yourself an opportunity to have a positive play. 27 tackles between Nick Cross and Julian Blackman, the two safeties, 43 in the secondary alone for the Colts on Sunday. And we kept calling, we talked about it during the broadcast, Nick, of talking about Nick Cross. We keep mentioning Nick Cross, Julian Blackman, those two guys, and it showed up on the stat sheet. On the flip side of that was a guy that, for every game that he had played against the Texans, Jonathan Taylor, he had done something significant, whether it was running for 100 yards, whether it was catching a, a touchdown pass. I think in the very first game we saw him in 2020, he had always done something positive, including 188 yards in Week 18. You look up at the end of Sunday, 16 carries, 48 yards. What was the biggest key in slowing down Taylor? And was that the biggest key in slowing them down, relatively speaking, outside of Anthony's magical toss world he was living in? Yeah, and we talked about this before the game. It was about getting multiple hats to the yep. ball and finishing on contact and just getting a body on a body, and tackling was going to be at a premium. So defense did a good job of just limiting the space. There was a couple runs that kind of popped through, but we didn't allow the big run. So, I mean, JT's a really good back. He's one of the better backs in the league. And then you're not going to just – it's not well, one person is going to stop one particular player, but – it's maintaining the integrity of the defense. If your responsibility is to set the edge, just set the edge, you force the ball back to the inside, and then you have your lateral pursuit from the defensive front, from the tackles, and then the linebackers as well. So defense is about 11 players doing the right thing on a consistent basis, and a run game takes multiple players because you have to deal with offensive linemen, tight ends, kind of the same thing we just talked about in the yep. offensive side mm -hmm. of the ball. So overall, our players took a lot of pride. They took a lot of ownership, and we were able to at least l mitigate some of the bigger runs. Yep. Um, and, you know, eight, uh, Anthony got out a few times, you know, the third down scramble, um, and then he had the other quarterback counter run that was a part of their running game. But overall, we were able to kind of limit the big play runs, didn't limit the big play passes. That was a big part of the game, but limited the big play runs because everybody was disciplined, everybody's in the right spot, and we were able to get multiple hats to the football. All the weapons you have on offense, we talked about the ground game, but it's such a collective effort. It's hard to identify the star of the game. Is it Nico? Is it CJ? Is it Diggs? Is it Joe? Who is it? Is this the blueprint? Is this the way you want to see it as an ensemble? Yeah, offense is about execution. Just everybody understanding, like, you're not going to get the ball on every play, but you're an option on every play. So whatever the coverage dictates, wherever the quarterback is supposed to go with the football, then hopefully, the, you know, CJ is going to make the right decisions, which more often than not that he does. So your job is to go out there, understand the play, understand the concept, make sure you're in the right position so that you are an option for the quarterback. So um, those guys did a good job of that. We were able to capitalize on some third down opportunities, kind of keep drives moving, had a couple fourth down conversions that ended up being you know, a big part of the game. So when that's offensive football, it's never going to be perfect or as clean as you would hope. You just hope that you would do enough, have enough positive plays, and everybody you know, have an opportunity to touch the ball, they're able to do something with it. And you know, I think we had – I don't know, seven or eight skilled players that had a reception in the game. We had multiple mm -hmm. players that had rushing attempts. So offensively, you're just trying to put as much stress on the defense as possible. Um, you know, we feel good about the players, the skilled players that we have when we're on the field. I'd love to see players go through adversity and then come out the other side and, and start to show progress. And I know a guy that had to do that in his third year now is Kenyon Green. And, and look, I know it's one game, Nick, but it's going against that front. Now, we know Grover and, and DeForest Buckner. I mean, you and I talked about fourth game. We talked about it last week at this time. Blocking those two guys was going to be a chore, and yet Kenny went out there and he battled, and he, he looked like he had been in the league for three years and had been playing for three years. How far has Kenyon come in the time that you've seen him? Yeah, we'll talk about Kenyon here in a minute. I would say the whole offensive line as a whole, that was as good of an effort that we probably put on a field in a long time. So those players took a lot of ownership. They had a lot of pride, and they went out there and put a good product on the field. In Kenyon's situation, really, in the end, it comes down to work and opportunity, and his opportunities were limited for a myriad of reasons here over the last few years. But we've talked about this. We talked about in the offseason, had the right approach, had the right mindset. It's one thing to do it in practice, but to yep. be able to carry it over into the game on the field in real live action, it hopefully instills a little bit of confidence, not only in yourself, but your teammates see it as well. So I think his teammates respect the work that he's put in. Ultimately, it's up to the player to take ownership and do the right things and put yourself in a position where you're able to go out there and play at a good level. So 
you know, certainly a credit to Kenyon and uh, coaches for putting him in that position. And he went out there and he played a good football game. So now we got to flip the page and get ready for another good front yeah. that we're going to see in some of the challenges that the Bears present. Yeah, we'll get to them. Johnny, you'll get to your question. I know, I'm, I'm over here <laughs> itching. I'm, I know, I'm, I'm I know like, you're come on, let's get, get to it. But I got to get one more on okay. that game because C.J. Stroud, the throw on third and 11, your reaction to that, the way you saw that, he's made a lot of tremendous throws in his career already. That was one of them. Yeah, it's two good players making a really outstanding play in a critical yeah. situation. So typically games are going to come down to a handful of plays that are going to shift the, the balance of the game one way or the other. So, I mean, talking about third down, time's running down. You're in that two-minute area. If you give the ball back, timeouts, no timeouts, trying to preserve the clock or if they were able to go down. So, I mean, it's two really good players who have put in a lot of work and a lot of time um, to be able to make that throw. Have the confidence to, A, make the throw from a quarterback's perspective, to put it in a position where your guy's going to get it or nobody else. And then for for Nico to make the play that he did, just the concentration, the balance, I mean, it speaks to the work that, that Nico has put in. It does – those types of things just don't happen overnight. You know, mm -hmm. you just don't you know, sprinkle fairy dust out there and all of a sudden go out there and make a good play. It's – a lot of work behind the scenes, a lot of yeah. conversation, a lot of trust in one another, and I think you saw that on display in that particular play. Okay, week one officially over. Done. Let's go to week two. Chicago Bears coming in here. Nick, I'm always fascinated by NFC teams because you see them every four years. Now, in our case, we saw them in 2022, but it even feels like for 22 to 24, it's a even much different squad. It's Sunday night right here at NRG Stadium, first time in five years that we're playing a Sunday night game. Uh, the crowd's going to be electric, but – the team on the other side, like you said, they're coming in with a great defensive front. Offensive line has improved. Caleb at quarterback. They've got some things that can hurt you. Let's go through the scouting report of the Bears. Yeah, I mean, that the team that we saw two years ago in this team, and this is like two – you might as well played them ten years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it starts at the top, um, you know, what Ryan and Coach Eberflus have done. Taking some work to kind of get to this point, but when you look at how the team has been constructed, they obviously had a plan in mind about how they wanted to put the team together. So – um, you know, Matt's done a really good job here the last through you know few years going into year three. Um, Matt's a really good coach. You know, we saw him when he was the coordinator in Indianapolis. Um, so, I mean, offensively, I mean, they've been able to assemble a pretty good offensive skill group. So, obviously, drafting Caleb number one overall, he's a very gifted thrower of the football. The thing about him, he's able to, I think he's moving to throw, you know, where you see some quarterbacks that are kind of moving, avoiding to run, he's moving to throw kind of has a unique way of keeping plays alive. So, I mean, a pass rush and keeping him in the pocket is going to be important. And then on the perimeter, um, you know, traded for Keenan Allen, um, who's been as productive a player as he's been in the league. DJ Moore is probably one of the more underrated receivers. He's a really good catch-and-run player. So when he gets a ball in his hands, he's hard to tackle. Um, drafted a Dunze. I know he was hurt there in the first game, so we see, we'll see if we see him. Um, I'd say one of the more like underrated players on their team is Cole Komet. I mean, this guy is a very steady, consistent, dependable player with really, really good hands. Um, signed Everett, who has experience in Coach Waldron's system. Um, you know, it's funny, Shane and I actually overlapped in our time in New England together. So he worked in operations and transitioned to coaching. So Shane's a bright guy, um, has a lot of experience, vast array of offenses, and he's kind of through the years been able to put something together. Um, they're kind of a game plan, I'd say, oriented teams trying to figure out what they have offensively. And you said it, John, you know, their offensive line, they had a number of players that they drafted in the first or second round. They mm -hmm. drafted right. You know, their left tackle actually, Braxton, they uh, drafted him in the fifth round, mm -hmm. drafted Jenkins. So um, I'd say they're a combination of youth and experience, you know, the offensive side of the ball. And then I'd say one of the key signings, DeAndre Swift, is very versatile three down back. So certainly present a lot of challenges offensively from a skill perspective and then defensively i mean this is a good defense i mean a really good defense i mean say between the defense and the kicking game they essentially won the titans game so good front and when you look at once they acquired sweat last year their production and performance mm -hmm. defensively improved exponentially so He's a unique player, long arms, can rush the passer. Um, they've actually gotten really good production from D-Walk on the other side, yep. so who was here in Houston a few years ago, so has some front flex. Made the trade kind of at the cut down with uh, Darrell Taylor, um, Ooh, who provides yeah. some edge rush, drafted Booker in the fourth or fifth round, whatever it was this year. So good on the edge, good inside. Billings is a load in there. So mm -hmm. And then drafted Dexter and Pickens. Dexter looks like he might be a little bit ahead of Pickens at this point. And then the two linebackers. <laughs> are really good football players. I mean, really good football players. Edwards, you know, you talk about team building and some of the things, how do you get players on your team? He's arguably one of their best players on defense, one of their best players on the team was undrafted. Yep. So led the team in tackles last year, very smart, very instinctive player. Edmonds, I mean, 6'4", 250, runs well. 
And then they're really kind of a nickel defense. They're a little bit like us. So their slot corner, uh, Kyler Gordon, who they drafted in the second round last year, gives them a good presence on the inside. And then really, you know, drafted you know, all three corners, if you will, were second round picks, right? They took Jalen, who's <laughs> one of the best corners in the league, and then Tyreek Stevenson, who played a bunch of ball last year on the other side. Um, and I signed Byard in free agency, who's a very experienced player who mm. we played a number of games against um, when he was in Tennessee. And Brisker's a good young player. Yep. So, I mean, they play with an attitude and a mindset on defense. And you've, Matt obviously has an influence. Coach Washington, a little bit more of a front. Matt, a little bit more of a secondary player or a secondary coach. So they kind of merge it together. Um, and in the kicking game, like they dominated the kicking game. So they have some good core players. Drafted the punter in the fourth round who, yep. you know, hits the ball really well. So, this is a really good football team that presents different challenges that we saw um, with the Colts. Um, so we're going to have to make sure we make some of the corrections from last week, and hopefully don't, they don't spill over into this week. What about that kicking game? Yeah, last week you had some great moments with Kaimi hitting three from 50 and beyond. You had the one you want back. They had a similar kind of situation, some good moments, some ones they want back. Yeah, no, they they blocked a punt for a touchdown. <laughs> J.O. scooped it up, yep. and, and they scored there. And then DeAndre Carter, who you know has had, had a stint in Houston at different points. Yep. We actually had him on a practice squad back in New England back in the day. Shows you how old I am. But 70-yard uh, kickoff return and a good punt return. So – they had in a the starting field position. There was a number of plays, a number of uh, series that started inside the twenty. So Tennessee was going on a long field. So certainly could present some challenges in the kicking game. So you know, hopefully we can get some of the things that we need to improve fixed. Um, and then the kicking game, as we see each week, can be a big part. Can, can have a huge impact on the game. There's no question. Nick, you said something about Caleb that that struck me, and I think sometimes. It, it, when you're talking about the quarterbacks that Texas are going to face, you're like, well, that guy's a dual threat, and that guy's a dual threat, and that guy's a dual threat. But they all sort of do things differently. Like Anthony Richardson, like you said, when he would scramble, he was going to run it because at 6'5", 245, he's going to turn up and go. But Caleb wants to keep his eyes down the field. So when you're facing Caleb versus Anthony, even though they, well, they're a dual threat quarterback, but they're completely different in the way they approach it, no? Yeah, it, it's any team. You just have to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each particular player, understanding who you're playing against, what are they trying to do. Um, you know, Caleb, I mean, he won a Heisman Trophy for a reason because he's a very talented player. So each, I would say, individual has their own skill set, and you just have to understand what you're playing against. So um, you saw that in the preseason. I mean, the throw he made there on the sideline yep. um, going to his left um, against Buffalo or wherever mm -hmm. it was. I mean, not too many quarterbacks that can make that play. So each week, like we talked about, presents its own unique yep. challenges. And, you know, he's, he's going to be a really good player in this league for a long time. One semi-procedural thing here for you and your staff. Sometimes we see a report, the Texans worked out so-and-so, but you guys work out players all the time, right? This is a weekly thing in a way to keep tabs on what's going on with the available players? Yeah, very much so, Mark. So we'll do it at really any point. We'll do it in the spring in May. We'll do it in the course of training camp. You know, we'll do it in the early part of the season. We'll do it pretty much any day during the week. I mean, some teams allocate like Tuesday as their designated workout day. We'll do it whenever. Sometimes it doesn't work logistically. So mm. And it's not necessarily everybody. You kind of have a list that you put together of, if we have an opportunity to bring this player in to get a little more information, let's go ahead and do it so that we make sure we're prepared for if we lose a player, what's our next best option? Is it already on our practice squad? Is it somebody on the street? Is there somebody on the street we want to add the practice squad that we can upgrade our depth, what we have here? So it's fairly fluid. I think once you get through September into October, then it becomes a little bit more specific, more case-by-case relative to something that happened in the game that may force your hand a little bit. So, uh, But to your question, yes, it's a, a part of the normal procedure. Mm. Some teams handle a little bit differently in terms of volume, how many they bring in, like what they actually do. So we just try to do what we feel makes the most sense for us and get as much information as possible so we make a good decision about adding a player to the team if we get to that point. Nick, it's been five years since playing on a Sunday night, and we've not played a ton of primetime games. In fact, last year we would have had all noon games until the one against the Indianapolis Colts. Your time in New England, you guys played a lot of night games, a lot of primetime games. Is there a key or something that you kind of rely on, you know, kind of getting in a routine because this kind of breaks the routine with a night game because you wake up in the morning, you're like, you're so used to, let me get to the bus, let me get to the, the place, let me get to the stadium, I get in my routine, but now all of a sudden it's a 7 o'clock game. And now that routine's kind of thrown off. How do you kind of go about that? Is that a big thing for the players to have to adjust to? Yes and no. I think you just have to work backwards from the game. You just it, What it affects is just the timing of the day. Yeah. So whatever your block is to get ready for the game, typically it's usually four or five hours before the game. So instead of doing that at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning with the game at noon, 
all right, the game's at 7 o'clock or 7.20, whatever it is, so then you kind of work backwards. So everybody just kind of has to adjust what they go through, just make sure that you're mentally and physically prepared for playing Sunday night. Now, some of that obviously will spill over into the next day as well because yep. it's a later game. So you just have to adjust and you have to be prepared. And I think what we have to do as an organization is make sure the players have what they need give them information and just make sure that that in the end they get themselves ready to play football. Whenever we kick off, we kick off, but you just have to make some subtle adjustments. You're not going to necessarily change anything drastically right. other than the timing of kind of everything that goes into that day. All right, a couple more things. This year, the Texans play the two oldest teams in the league with the Bears and the Packers. The Bears, when you think of them, you think of the 85 Bears. So better defense, Nick, the 85 Bears or the 2,000 Ravens. Or you can throw in a writing candidate if you want. Uh, There's a reason behind this selection. So I'm going to say the 85 Bears for the sole purpose. So when the Super Bowl took place, I can't remember how old. I must have been, what, 9 or 10 years old at the time. Yeah, me too. So I'll probably get in trouble. Hopefully the league won't find me for this. But – I had a, we had a, our parents kind of made a little wager for us that if, okay, the fridge scored a touchdown or mm-hmm. in the Super Bowl, <laughs> yeah. that we would get new bikes. You were nine. I think so, you're safe. So, wait, you got new bikes new and bikes? fridge scored? So, so the fridge scored, Ooh. right? On yeah, the fullback dive. Oh. So we, were, we got new bikes as a result of that. So we were going crazy. But I mean, those defenses, I mean, both of those defenses, I mean, were as good as they come. And when you go back through that, I mean, the front, the caliber of players at all three levels of the mm-hmm. defense, I mean, you can't go wrong either way. I'm just going to kind of tilt it <laughs> because the fridge scored. We got bikes out of it. So. Very nice. <laughs> and out of it. fans are encouraged to wear Liberty white. Everybody's got to wear white Sunday night. Get all fired up when the fa- when the team comes out of the tunnel. Be there early. That does make a difference for the guys, right? When the when the crowd is there, when the team comes out, the electricity, all of it. Yeah, our crowd makes a difference. So, like, if anything, I can say anything. Encourage you to get there early. Be as loud as you can be. Um, it's this is the old faux pas. You can't wear white after Labor Day or something like that. We're going to make an exception here for Liberty White on Sunday night. So it should be a great environment, great atmosphere. Hopefully we can go out there and play a good football game against a good team. Yeah, it's a rookie quarterback, too. Like, get all in his ears. You know, if you see his hands up like this, yeah. that's what you need. Uh, and colleges have done that uh, with the, the Coach Comp system. I, I know you've been scouting a little bit, but have you talked to them about how that's gone? You know, we've just kind of seen it. But, yeah, the coach, the quarterback, same thing. Cuts off at 15 seconds. They have the two-minute. They're mm-hmm. calling it a timeout, but it's two-minute warning. So you're starting to see a little bit of a spillover, college yeah. or pro, pro to college. So um, I'm sure the coaches probably like having the ability to communicate um, with the quarterback instead of having them look at, you yeah. know, the sign on the sideline. Yeah. Those big they can, cards. They can cards. talk to them directly. So um, okay. it actually helps the quarterback when they transition from college to our level for sure. Okay, here's the other one. And I'm wondering if this will happen in NFL. In a long talk with – um, but somebody from Exos at Big 12 Media Days, and he said in college, they now can look at the surface and they can look at video. We can only look at the stills here. Do you think that changes in time that you'll be able to look at video on the sideline? Yeah, we've experimented a little bit in the preseason, so ultimately the league will make a determination about what they feel makes the most sense, mm-hmm. and I think the one thing about teams, everybody adapts and adjusts yeah. to whatever the rules and circumstances are, so it just goes back to you're just seeing a lot of crossover between the two entities, if right. you will. So college concepts have kind of spilled over into our level. You have some things that are you know, implemented in the pro game that are going to the college. So um, and hopefully it just helps everybody. And whatever they tell us we can do, yeah, exactly. then we'll abide by the rules. Nick, thanks a lot. Good luck. Thanks, fellas.